Hey guys, welcome back for another episode of the Two Minute Warning. I'm Blake Showalter. And I'm Ben Tabacadias. And I know it's the third week in a row we're supposed to talk SEMO sports, but not all to talk about, so we're sticking to pro sports for this episode. Hopefully next week we've got some SEMO sports to talk about, but starting off, we're talking about the UFC. Huge fight announcements, but starting off, we got Oliveira versus Benil Dariush. We're pretty excited for this one, aren't oh, we? Oh yeah, 100%. This fight was confirmed by Charles Oliveira saying that he and Benil Dariush have been in talks and in the works, and so I'm really excited to see how this go- is going forward. Both fighters really experienced, really have a fantastic records. I think Bar- Vanille Darnoush is on a uh, eight-fight winning streak right now, going into this matchup with a lot of momentum. Charles Oliveira obviously just lost to Islam Makachev, but still, probably the most dangerous fighter in the lightweight division aside from Islam. He can do everything from his back. Um, uh, he can submit people. He can uh, strike well. He just brings pressure like no other. This is one of those matchups that we've just been logging to see for a long time. We're actually going to get it. Yeah, man, I really like this fight stylistically because Darnoosh really reminds me of Gilbert Burns as far as he puts his head down, he's swinging for the fences, really, really tough guy, great cardio, and also pretty competent ground game. But as far as this goes, I think Oliver has the edge. I, as you know, Oliver is known to get clipped in that first round and go straight to his back and catch people in guillotines and triangle chokes. And uh, really good submissions off of his back. So I see this going down as a submission for Oliveira. He gets back into that title conver- conversation, builds momentum, and gets back on that winning streak that he was on for so long. Yeah, I, I have to take the other road here. I'm a big Benil Darnoush fan, and I love the way this guy fights. All out intensity, like you mentioned, just head down and swings. He's very technical. Something He's kind of wild, but he's also technical in terms of the ground game, in terms of his striking. He actually has very competent ground game, very underrated ground game. I think it'll hold up very well against Charles Oliveira. So we're going to have to see whenever May 6th comes around, but I think that Benil Darnoush squeaks out a victory here. Yeah, and I don't think this one goes to the decision either. I think it's going to be a finish whether Benil gets a knockout maybe in the second or third round or if Oliveira does get that submission, but not going to go to the decision, I don't think, but we're in for a good one, man. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, this is the next um, uh, title challenger for the lightweight division. Islam Makachev's next opponent, whether it be uh, Oliveira or Darnoush. Really exciting to see how they line up against Makachev, or if Makachev just goes straight up into another uh, rematch with Alexander Volkanovsky, which all of us MMA fans would love to see. Definitely some huge implications, and definitely looking forward to it. But next up, we have another huge fight announcement. We've got Aljo versus Cejudo. Two great ground opponents, and uh, it's going to be a good one. So Hudo's coming back. I mean, been away for a while. It's going to mm. be interesting to see where, where his cardio is at, where his, uh, where, where his power is at. I mean, he's older now, too. But I think Cejudo has the advantage here. I know you think kind of differently, but what do you think? I definitely think, I kind of agree with you. Cejudo does have the advantage in some departments. His fight IQ, much higher than Aljamain Sterling. His wrestling, he can hold him down on the ground as he is an Olympic gold medalist in wrestling. I think Aljamain Sterling has a little bit more advantage in jiu-jitsu, but I do think Cejudo has more advantage in in power. So it's just up in the air here. Obviously, Cejudo, a uh, a flyweight and bantamweight division champion uh, back in the day before he retired. Now he's out of retirement. But uh, I think it's really exciting, good for the division for him to come back in this absolute shark tank of a division. Uh, the bantamweight division, probably the most stacked other than the lightweight division right now in the UFC with the top five being Sean O'Malley, Peter Yan, uh, Marab Divashili, Marilyn Vera, and Corey Sanhagen. This is just a league full of killers. So if Cejudo can come back in here and beat Aljo, it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Yeah, man, and this fight, when I want to look at it, when it comes down to it, two really good ground opponents, but I look at what Aljo did versus Jan, and he really, really impressed me with his ground game and how good his wrestling has come, and I know he was a, I know he was a wrestler in college, and I know he's known for his ground game, but his, his wrestling is just really taken some major strides in these past couple of fights, but Cejudo is an Olympic gold medalist, and he's also great with his hands, too, so I think Cejudo, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a finish, that, that per se, but I think this will be a decision, unanimous decision, that is, for Cejudo. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with you there. Yeah, then next up, we have the XFL Week 2. We had a pretty exciting week in Week 1, but we're at Week 2. Tomorrow, I mean, by the time this video is out, the game will be over, so you guys know before us, but we got the Battle Hawks, our Battle Hawks, taking on the Seattle Sea Dragons. Going to be a good game, man. Yeah, definitely. Seattle Sea Dragons losing to the number one ranked team, the D.C. Defenders, um, uh, in a close game, 18-22. Uh, to 22. Uh, So it's going to be an interesting game. I'm really excited to see our Battle Hawks come out there. They're riding off of a win, as we mentioned in the last episode, come from behind victory. Uh, so building momentum going forward, if they can get a win here, they're only going to keep winning. I think this is uh, going to be a, a big um, a momentum gain in the season as the Seattle Sea Dragons, like I mentioned. They're pretty good. So interesting game, really tough matchup, intriguing, exciting, and XFL, man. What more can we say? Yeah, man. But the one thing that does concern me about this game is that the Battle Hawks scored 15 of their 18 points in the last minute 30 of the game. I mean, that's a pretty big concern. And, uh, I mean, that's them going for broke. That wasn't a part of their game plan at all. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do against this team. They are a good team. I know they lost, but they lost to what CBS has ranked as number one in the D.C. Defenders. So going to be interesting to see how we fare against them. And if we win this game, I think we're top three in the league. Right now we're ranked fourth by CBS. So 
really looking forward to. Again, you guys kind of know before us, but we don't know yet. So yeah. comment for right down below. Yeah, um, and then also we got another matchup versus the Brahmas versus the Vipers. This is kind of like a trash bowl, not going to lie. So uh, hopefully we get some high score matches. They have really bad defenses, but they got that game then, there. And then we got the Renegades versus the Roughnecks. That's going to be the game of the week. The uh, Roughnecks are second in the league, and the Renegades are fourth. But uh, besides that, it's pretty much all I got for XFL. Like anything else? No, not really. I just love XFL. It's very entertaining. I love it too, man. It's like what the NFL. Uh, I, I kind of wish the NFL took some of the rules. I mean, I kind of, I kind of hope it turns into like what the G League is for the NBA, and then it takes some rules from stuff like that. But moving on, we have the MLS coming up, and that's pretty much your category. So take it away, Beto. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, for those who don't know, MLS is just kind of like uh, the soccer league of America. So everything that American sports do with their other leagues, NBA specifically, is more similar in terms of playoffs, in terms of. Uh, uh, standings and stuff like that it's it's the same so uh for those who want to want to watch um uh, st louis is playing this is our first season into the mls uh, they're playing austin uh austin fc who came in semifinals last year so it's going to be a very tough matchup for our uh st louis city fc uh but it's it's going to be intriguing i'm very excited to see how this new team fares um uh, but definitely um uh, something to watch uh for anyone this is something that you can watch you know, regardless of town regardless of position regardless of location there's always a team um, um, uh, it opens on uh, Saturday at 3.30 um, uh, with, of course, Nashville SC, my team playing against NYC FC. Going to be a very good game, very close game, but I think my Nashville uh, will come out 2-1. to one. So back to you, Blake. St. Louis has a team that's pretty much all I know. But lastly, <laughs> NBA, we know about that. You know about that. I know about that. And we got, uh, we're talking, we're really going to talk about it last episode. By the way, we did a film yesterday, so kind of following up off that episode. But the Clippers are now signing Russell Westbrook after Utah bought him out. Essentially what happened is that Russ didn't want to be with Utah. Can't really blame him. Guess not really a big Mormon guy, but, you know, who is? Except for BYU. But, you know, Clippers take him up. It's going to be – I think he fits in pretty well with that roster. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think so, too. He complements everyone pretty well. As we know, obviously they have Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. I think if he could you know, be a little bit more ball-dominant rather than he was in the Lakers, I think he could really create some opportunities in space for not only PG to shoot, but also um, uh, Kawhi Leonard to get open. He, Kawhi Leonard's off-ball movement is very elite, one of the most uh, elite in the NBA. So it's going to be interesting to see how he fits into the squad and if he can regain his old form. Uh, he was shooting from the three-point line at a 29.6%, abysmal from Russ's standards. So hopefully he can regain some of his explosiveness, some of his killer instinct. He can get back to his old form and maybe even lead the Clippers into a title charge. Yeah, kind of interesting. He's kind of moving down the block from where the Lakers are. And I think it is a much better fit for him with that roster. I mean, you know, LeBron likes to take over games. Like you say, Kawhi is really good at playing off the ball. Russ is pretty pretty comfortable with handling the situation as far as just controlling games and dishing it out. And then also, he did have some games early in the season where he was able to take over and have a really good stat line. So it's going to be interesting what he does in this new environment. Not really that different of an environment. He's still in L.A., but that's pretty much all I have for this episode. Man, you got anything else? No, I'm all good. Well, this has been the Two Minute Warning. I'm Blake Showalter. I'm Beto Vacadillas. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Be sure to follow us at the Two Minute Warning with an underscore on it. And also follow the Southeast Arrow on Twitter, Facebook, and of course, subscribe to our channel down below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you guys next time.